coming to you on behalf of EPIC. EPIC is Empowering People, Inspiring Community. We're a conscious living publication uh, distributed every two months um, that brings to you educational, inspiring features, articles, recipes, and a whole lot of love. And I could not come to you on behalf of EPIC without mentioning the other half of EPIC, Lisa, the co-publisher and co-creator of this Conscious Living publication is working hard in Cheshire to manage our feed. Lisa is responding to any comments. So let her know that you're here. Just give us a shout out. Let us know how you're doing. Um, also, that's how I know you can see me. It, it says live here, but I have no idea until we see your comments starting to come through. So please type in a few comments. Um, and you're going to be so excited when I bring on our guest, Dr. Dorothy Neville. Um, I'm going to bring Dr. Dorothy on in a few minutes. But I do have a few um, things to share. As always, please know that during this time, if you're feeling isolated, if you're feeling alone, we are here for you. Pick up the phone. Give us a call. Our numbers are on our Facebook pages, websites. Um, we'll also be sharing a landing page where you can submit your prayer request. You are not alone. We are here for you and together we will rise. So I wanted to say that. I hope you're all enjoying this beautiful day. And before I bring Dr. Dorothy out, I just want to give you a little background. I just spoke with her and told her I'm a little bit nervous. She, um, she comes to us from Old Saybrook. She is a powerful, beautiful woman who um, is an executive leadership consultant. She is coming to us from Old Saybrook, Connecticut. And there's a quote I came across that I really think embodied how I felt when I was just introduced to Dr. Dorothy. And it is from Larry Ford, who's the CEO of Conscious Capital. And Larry said that see here where is the oh dr dorothy dr dorothy is a powerhouse with a special gift to see right through you to get to the heart of the matter so i am going to bring through this powerhouse dr dorothy who also contributed to our may june epic in an article titled a new understanding of mental health and welcome dr dorothy hi hello thanks so much oh my goodness this is uh, just have to give a shout out to Sharon Farber. I know you're watching Sharon and um, small world, huh? <laughs> small world. So welcome to Epic. Welcome. And as a, um, a business owner, doctor, healer, that really is focusing on working with the conscious visionary leaders and bringing them up to their fullest potential or right. helping to expose their fullest potential. Yeah. How did you get to this point? Can you give us a little bit of your journey, your story of who Dr. Dorothy is and how you got to what you're doing today for our world? Well, I've been here a bit, so there's a long story. I'll make it really short for you. Pretend I'm 25. I, um, I really started out, I was raised in an orphanage to begin with, and I was later adopted by an Irish alcoholic cop and raised in the housing projects in South Boston. And so I grew up being aware of hanging with the Aces and the Saints and the Mustangs and whatever gang was the, whatever boyfriend I had, whatever gang he hung with, that was the gang I belonged to because mm -hmm. that's how we belong to. Women only belonged if that's where their boyfriend was. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. So then eventually decided to leave all of that and I became a Catholic nun for a number of years. Um, uh -huh. My name is Sister James Marie, and um, at some point left religious life, moved to Manhattan, and became an international airline stewardess, and flew for Transworld Airlines all over the world. And that was another adventure. Life was filled with adventures that we're meant to live. Right. And eventually got married and settled down here in Connecticut, and had two exquisite children, and was divorced when they were very little. So I went back to work and became here on the ground and became um, a psychotherapist. I had a master's in psychotherapy and um, had a psychotherapy practice for 27 years. And while I was seeing 42 patients a week and while I was in practice, 
I became bored, not because of a legacy. I was a single mom with two children and I was seeing 42 patients a week, but I wasn't being stimulated. I wasn't being challenged anymore. Um, therapy was just natural for me. Supporting people was just natural. And so I thought, what do I want to do? And, and I started seeing patterns in my patients that certain personalities were predisposed to particular disorders that I saw all of those that had this disorder seemed to have this kind of personality. Those with this disorder seemed to have this kind of personality. And that intrigued me because mm. nobody in the medical world told us about that. So I went on and became certified in nine different modalities of integrative health care because why not jump into something you love, you're passionate about it, you want to know everything there is to know about it. And so I did and uh, learned a lot and ended up actually doing my doctoral dissertation on the psychological and spiritual causes of physical disease and disorders. And I was blessed to receive grant funding to research my work with fibromyalgia patients. So looking at the psycho-spiritual causes of fibro, and I created an eight-week protocol. And at the end of it, over 87% of those who worked with us for eight weeks no longer had any limitations. They had come in walkers and canes and, and excruciating pain, and 87% were more than able to go and do their lives the way they had always done it. Um, with just eight weeks of looking at the psychological, spiritual, and physical energetic elements of fibromyalgia. So I uh, had people on my, I was blessed with the waiting list, and people on my waiting list to see me as a therapist got together and asked me to open up a school. So I opened up a school and um, started with a six-week program in, in self-healing for the human energy field. And notice that I said, Spirit, if this, if I get, you know, more than 10, I'll know I'm meant to do this. And 32 signed up for the first one. <laughs> Okay, spirit, here we go. And so when it was over, I said, let me try it again. If this helps people learn, I'm, I'm all for it. So after noticing that there's the same core group showed up every single time I offered it, and I said, why on earth? My children at that point were teenagers. They would pay somebody to listen to me instead of them having to do so. Why do you keep coming back? And they said, because you extrapolate differently. You give different stories. It's the same outline. Mm -hmm. But you give different case studies, different stories. You, you're always teaching us new kind of programs. So I opened up the Institute of Healing Arts and Sciences, which was a program that developed a two-year and four-year program in energy medicine. And I was blessed. We had students that were moving all over the country or living all over the country in Canada. And my my work is now paper. The government of Australia pays for people to receive the, the wise method that I received. And um, people were flying in from the Caribbean. Larry Ford lived down in the islands in St. John. And um, I was blessed. So we had people, the third and fourth year students required to do medical internships. So we had people opening up integrative health departments in hospitals and medical facilities across the country. And I was blessed. And um, so what I ended up doing is this little thing that I was teaching. By the time it finished, I had teachers and TAs and preceptors overseeing the medical internship programs and supervisors of the preceptors and, and lots of office staff, vice president of marketing, vice president of this and that. And I thought, whoa, how on earth did a little kid from the projects end up with not only a highly successful practice, but a highly successful school? I then opened up a nonprofit because hospitals wanted to give us grants and um, they wanted to do it to nonprofits because it's a better tax write off for them. And thought when I was growing up, the only lawyers I knew were bills, bondsmen, and people that got you out of trouble. Yeah. And now I had lawyers setting up LLCs, setting up nonprofits, lawyers for taxes, lawyers for. I thought, oh my God, I didn't even know all those kinds of lawyers existed. And so I realized that. When you end up having a dream and you follow it, your dream can create a life of its own. And you've got to develop the willingness to become the leader of your own life, the leader of your dream. And then if you've got a company, the leader of the people who are working with you and for you, that leadership skills are imperative and really owning our power, owning our ability to go forward um, really requires us to, to step up and, and look at us as leaders, look at who we want to be. Um, it, is, it is an amazing process. And that is, is 
Am I correct in understanding that that is what you're focused on right now primarily is the leadership skills and, and building and working with individuals and um, whether they're um, professional individuals or, or just from a personal aspect, building that leadership, um, building their leadership skills. Am I correct in saying that? That is it. Yes. I, I was doing the therapy and when my youngest left for Cornell University, I left the country and moved to the Caribbean. And I had for 10 years, I lived in Anguilla. And when I came back to America, eventually, you know, for, for many reasons, um, I came back to the United States. I had a small private practice and I had a day free because I still was running the school and, and all these things. And I noticed that those who were coming to me theoretically for therapy really didn't need therapy. They were in leadership positions and didn't know how to lead. And coaching had not existed when I left the country, but now it was not the thing of the moment. So I thought, let me go and study that and see what that is. So I went and studied coaching with somebody who would help develop Tony Robbins coaching programs. Okay. And um, out in uh, Marina Del Rey in California. And so I studied with her out there. And thought, this is really what I want to do is help these women and men really learn how to bring leadership skills out of themselves, to learn how they betray themselves, to learn how they give their power up to learn how they become frightened because the more you grow, the more you need to be willing to have a larger and larger energetic footprint mm -hmm. because the more powerful they are, the, the greater our energetic footprint, the more impact and influence we get to have. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to have great impact and great influence, God willing, it's coming from the center of who you are and not from your ego or your fears and your defenses. So yeah. it's really helping leaders learn to lead from the essence of who they are. From the heart. From, from the, the heart and the soul. The uh, you know, I, I grew up Christian. Well, I was a grew Christian, and I, I don't necessarily practice religion at this point in my journey, but I truly believe we are embodied souls and that we are all intrinsically holy and intrinsically good. Mm -hmm. And when we stop long enough to catch up with ourselves, we remember the infinite goodness within us. And if that's the place from which we lead, we are truly transforming how we do leadership. We're transforming who it is we are choosing to become. And we're here, we become everything we came here to become. And that ripple effect when we do lead from a conscious heart-centered space, right. the ripple effect of that on our world, on our families, our communities, our states, it's just right. it's beyond even comprehension. And I, I do feel, um, I, I speak from myself, when I begin to grow, whether it be in my practice or my ministry, I'm, an, I'm a minister also. Um, so there's a lot of different aspects of Samantha, but the closer I get, each step I take towards success, there's a part of me that holds myself back. So it is it is really learning these leadership skills, I think, that would help me and I'm sure would help many people in business, life, whatever it is, um, to take that next step, create that larger energetic footprint, own it from a place of wholeness from and strength and power. So what we're doing, Dr. Dorothy, is Lisa's putting out your contact information so people can contact you. Thank you. Um, and we talked a little bit about um, the current situation with COVID right. and the isolation. Can you share a few ideas on how people might be able to navigate through this and grow through it as opposed to simply survive? Which is imperative. If all you're doing is surviving this, yeah. what that says to me is in any challenge you face in your life, all you do is survive in it because all this pandemic is, is another challenge. And how you deal with challenges is how you're dealing with this. Mm -hmm. You can become a victim mm -hmm. and overwhelmed and act out. I'm resenting the, the government, my governor, my, my whatever for telling me I have to stay home. I'm resenting really. So when you're challenged, even if it's for your own good, you go to resentment. That's an option. Or um, notice that some people, when they go to challenge, step back and take a deep breath. And if in this shelter at home, 
we did stop and step back and take a deep breath. Whether we're working at home for a major organization or we're entrepreneurs and we're working at home because that's what we're doing, or we're out of a job at the moment, you know, um, and collecting unemployment and we're home. What you were doing there is either surviving this mm -hmm. and living in the state of victim, the state of powerlessness, the illusion that you have nothing to do and everybody else is in charge of your life or the world, the universe is in charge of your life, however you see this. Mm -hmm. When you begin to see that in every struggle we have and every challenge we have, there's a gift. And what is that gift for you? And if that gift is you now have the time because you're not commuting, you now have the time every morning for meditation. You now have the time in that meditation to truly learn to practice mindfulness, to practice the ability to sit in the present moment. How are you feeling in this present moment? Is it angry? Is it powerless? Is it frustrated? Is it lost? Is it frightening? Because this is the first time you've had to catch up with you in your life because you've been running your entire life from who you are, all right? So if you stop and catch up with you, not the world around you, not your kids, not your partner, you, through meditation every morning, through the practice of mindfulness, you also then have the ability to learn emotional intelligence. Now, I know when somebody says this, I go into defense, I think they're challenging me. When somebody says that, I think they're putting me down. When somebody says that, and the fact is, they may have none of those intentions, but you get to understand yourself emotionally, and that's the emotional intelligence, that I know what my emotions do in particular situations, which then says I have the ability to respond differently and never react. So the more I learn about my emotional responses or my emotional reactions, the more personal power I have, less victim, the more personal power I have to really be the leader of my own life, to lead how I respond, to lead how I live my life, to lead how I do my relationships, rather than always be in reaction to. I have this ability to continuously learn to respond from an emotionally balanced place because I'm living mindfully because of my practice of meditation. You do that a half an hour in the morning, 15 minutes in the morning, whatever you're capable of, and you wake up in relationship with yourself, there's less chance you're going to lose you in the course of the day. And the more you do that, the more that feels like home, the more in the middle of the day you find yourself stopping coming back into meditation state, into mindfulness, into an awareness of what's going on for you emotionally. And you really begin to change how you do your life yeah. so that the man or woman that leaves this pandemic situation will not be the man or woman that started out in this pandemic situation. Right. To grow through it. To grow through it. To grow through it. And, and just, not that I think it's this marvelous gift. I've watched more TV in the past two months than I have watched in many, many years. Streaming, God, we didn't even know streaming back in the old days. I know. Um, getting addicted to these shows that show up. And we can condemn ourselves for it or get lost in it or just enjoy it and then go back to our lives. Right. And take take the leadership back. Yeah. I would mm -hmm. um, Wow, thank you for that. Thank you so much. It, it for me, um, coming one of the largest um, messages, lessons, whatever it is, gifts, is that quote to stop responding. I'm sorry, stop reacting and right. start responding. Right. I have it pinned here on my board, and I have to remind myself throughout the day Good. about that. Um, but look at how smart you are that you know you put the sign up there. Yes. That's smart. Mm -hmm. That is conscious decision. 
a conscious decision to be the leader of your life and your responses rather than your reactions. Reactions always come from fear, always come from fear. So what you're saying is I'm choosing not to live my life in fear. And it's a process and learning skills each day right? Um, and talking to people such as yourself and not only that, but tapping into that spiritual um, essence of whom I am and whose I am um, helps me to also stay grounded, stay centered in the moment, stay in the moment, stop that crazy reacting um, and, and start responding from that core. Right. And, and to be able to take these skills and this time of COVID and isolation and to grow from it. When this first started, I would have said you were out of your mind. There's no way. And now almost as we start to reopen and go back out there, there's a part of me that doesn't even feel ready to yeah. do that. That doesn't even feel prepared enough to do that. Um, so thank you for sharing that, sharing this with us. You had mentioned about um, as we do go back out, we're, we could see um, some PTSD, some trauma from this. Can you explain a little bit about that from, from a spiritual aspect, how maybe we can begin to prepare for that? And I know that you said mindfulness, but is there anything else that will help us re-enter into the new world? <laughs> it's, the awareness, it's an awareness that is you here. And now we're talking about this differently. There may be some who just being in their homes created some level of PTSD. They, they felt trapped. They felt imprisoned. And if they had early childhood experiences along those lines, then mm -hmm. it's going to feel really horrific for them. There is also uh, frontline people. You know, the doctors and nurses, if they're in their profession long enough, will have experience losing one, two, maybe three patients over the course of a career that were so far gone when they came into treatment that there's nothing could be done for them. But these people now may be seeing that number or more per day dying on their, on their watch. And the trauma of that, the trauma of feeling helpless, of feeling hopeless, of feeling overwhelmed, of feeling that they failed, or feeling that they didn't have the equipment they needed to do it. They don't have the masks, they don't have the gowns, they don't have the gloves, they don't have the ventilators, they don't have anything that they need to support them. You know, there's so few pieces of equipment, and I'm not going into politics on this, but there's so few of these things around to support our frontline people that um, they come out of it a very different way. And so how do we support them, which is a different experience than those who, in being confined to their homes, remember being trapped as children, you know, or if they are assault survivors, all right? Those frontline folk are coming out of a war zone that they were never trained for, right. are coming out of being surrounded by death and unable to help people because of the lack of equipment and a lack of understanding of the disease. This isn't something they could study. It's brand new. We're all still learning about it. Right. And how do you treat something you don't even understand? Right. And so for them, there's going to be another whole potential situation that needs to be dealt with. You know? I am so, so grateful that the frontline workers and each one of us has access to people like you um, that to me uh, have your you know you're, you have your heart open and your your hand out to say come with me i can help you so thank you for being oh, you're dr so dorothy thank you for being dorothy you, you know um and sharing that light and that wisdom and knowledge and wit with us and with our community and with the frontline workers and everybody. Um, it is an honor 
to be here communicating and conversing with you. Um, I do believe that this is the beginning of a relationship. Um, I can't wait to talk to Sharon and uh, Lisa's looking forward to meeting you. So thank you for sharing you know, your story. And as we begin to, um, you know, go about our day and go about our, our journey here, um, is there any thought that you would like the viewers to leave with? Anything to close out? I usually ask an impromptu question, but I'm not being drawn to do that. Um, how about, a, okay, how about this? How about a quote from Dr. Dorothy? What's your favorite quote, your favorite meme, share? Give us a tidbit. There's so many that we could go with. I this. know. <laughs> but but I, the message I would love to get across is something I say frequently, humor and faith get us through this journey. Whatever your faith system is, is irrelevant. It is your faith system, honor it. And humor, we can watch all of these movies in these series that are about murder and death and all of these things, or we could watch Mamma Mia, yeah. all right? We could watch something that gets us singing and dancing and laughing and in love with life. We cannot forget that no matter how serious something is, we need to have the ability to access humor. If we don't, we get lost and the heaviness and serious and heavy are two dramatically different things. You know, I take this pandemic seriously. I have my mask if I go out. I pretty much stay in the house, but I social distance if I'm out there. So I take it seriously, but that doesn't mean I don't laugh a lot. <laughs> Humor and laughter truly allow us to keep life in perspective. And no matter what's going on, we need laughter in our lives. And, and to my, I would just say, please don't forget, no matter how serious this situation is, we've got to maintain a sense of humor. We have got to look and see that there's humor and love and joy throughout life. There truly is. Every moment, every moment of every day is a gift. Yes. Yes. Is a gift. Thank you so much, Dr. Dorothy, for helping me unwrap my day and our viewers unwrap our day as the gift that you bring you are and we are and as i say to all of our beautiful viewers and community stay well yes stay home stay you stay tuned and peace out epic scouts we'll see you tomorrow thank you bye bye